Checo Perez has signed an extension with Red Bull through 2026. Laz, I'll start with you. Right call by Red Bull. Well, Red Bull had a lot of options. You know, it felt like going into here. They're, they're clearly the top team under this current regulation set. Whether that will continue into 2026 is a big question that's wide open, which is also why we have all this speculation around Max Verstappen. But what they've done is they've gone for a bit of stability there, of course. They want to keep Max. That's their number one priority, and he is contracted through to 2028. And by keeping Checo there, I think they'll keep Max happy. Max likes the idea of being teammates with Checo. You know, so far, there's been a few little fireworks along the way, but it's been pretty one-sided. So Max will know that as long as he's at that team and that team is competitive, he's the one that's going to be leading it. So I think there's a little bit of that. Um, I guess they know what they're getting with Checo. You know, it's... It's not always great, but um, it is fairly consistent. If you bring someone else into the mix, there's a number of really good drivers out on the market. Carlos Sainz, uh, Esteban Ocon, uh, you know, we'll talk about him in, in a bit. But there's a few drivers which you could bring in, but would you destabilize the team? And I think that was something they really didn't want, considering how unstable that team has been so far this year. So I can kind of, un- I can kind of understand the logic behind it. But what's interesting is that if you look at the championship this year, you know, we st- went into this year thinking, well, Red Bull have such a big car advantage. There's no way they're not going to win both championships at a canter. You know, do we even need to tune in for 24 races a year? And now you look at the Constructors' Championship, and I think the gap is 24 points. And the reason for that is because Ferrari have two exceptional drivers mm-hmm. in Charles Leclerc and Carlos Sainz, both having scored a win um, kind of against the odds, I suppose, to some extent this year. And... Red Bull, where if you look at where they're dropping points, it's with Checo. Also, that this comes after two pretty disappointing results uh, for Checo as well um, is is interesting. But that also goes to show that these decisions aren't based on, you know, what happened at the last race or even what's happened at the last three races. They're long term decisions based on a number of factors. Uh, And I think a big one of these is, is just that stability going forward. Are you guys surprised, Nate, that it was two years as compared to maybe a one and one situation? Yeah, that's what stood out in the in the uh, announcement. And usually <clears throat> teams can be quite clever with that when it is a one plus one or a two plus one. You get the language of kind of multi-year deal or has has or just sometimes it's just will will stay with the team beyond 2024. You know, it can be that vague. So I was surprised by that. And I was actually told in Monaco by by somebody who's pretty well connected with the team that it was a one plus one deal. And it's kind of been a sticking point, I think, for Perez. He's wanted that stability for obvious reasons. You you know, you have a one plus one deal. It's effectively a one-year contract because that one-year extension is on the side of the team and you have to basically prove to them again you're worth that second season. And that's just not a good situation to be in. A lot of drivers say when they're on that kind of deal, you know, it's it's difficult to stay focused. I mean, that was a big thing for Bottas. If you remember in the Mercedes days with Lewis, he kept getting one-year deals and he just was constantly... Basically, in the same cycle of he'd sign a new deal, he'd have a few months where he wasn't asked about it. <laughs> January the 1st came around and everyone was just asking about his contract again. So you can see how it becomes an issue for drivers. What is interesting, if it is two years, and I've, 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 you know, I've checked in with Red Bull just to be like, hey, have you worded this or is this two years? And what, you know, what they're saying is, no, this is a two-year contract. What's interesting with that is that from everything that Lawrence, all the conversations Lawrence and I have had in the paddock, is we know Carlos Sainz wanted this seat above anything else for, again, obvious reasons, right? keeps him at the front end of the grid. What Red Bull said was the sticking point there was he wanted a long-term contract with Red Bull. They weren't willing to give him that. You know, they were like, well, here's a one-year deal. Sainz said, no, you know, I've signed plenty of those short deals in in my past. I want something longer. We know that Williams has now emerged as, you know, potential um, landing spot for him. And, you know, I I think this deal will probably, I mean, we know where Sainz is going to go sooner rather than later. So it's interesting they've gone for two years. And it does speak to the point that Lawrence made about keeping um, Max Verstappen happy. You know, you 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 get a driver in who he likes working with, who I don't think really causes any headaches behind the scenes. Really, you know, and I'm not saying Carlos Sainz is renowned for being a bad teammate. Far from it. But I think you put someone like Carlos Sainz in there, you're adding an unknown. In. You're dynamic. adding a guy. Yeah, and you're adding also you're adding a guy in Sainz who still believes he can be world champion. I think a guy who has really only just recently had his breakthrough in the last couple of seasons. Perez you know, with the greatest respect to Perez, I think that's kind of been beaten out of him a little bit, again, to use the Bottas example, like it was with him at Mercedes. So you have that kind of driver who knows like, hey, this is a pretty cushy situation. I'm not going to win the championship, but I'm still going to be driving one of the best cars in Formula One. I think that you keep that guy in the team. Signs could just be such a destabilizing presence at a time, as we know, 
when things behind the scenes at Red Bull have been far from calm for a while. So yeah, it did surprise me in the wording of it, but the more you look into it and, you know, I think the max factor, you know, keeping him happy, if they looked at it and said, right, if we give Perez a two-year deal, it's it potentially helps us keep Max down the line. We know that Max potentially, you know, has kind of looked at the Mercedes option going forward. Then it makes a lot of sense on that side. But yeah, it's it's very interesting because it also it kind of locks down where they're at for a couple of seasons if if other drivers become available. So um, not the not the duration I was expecting at all. I find it interesting what you said about Carlos Sainz wanting a long term deal, and maybe that was kind of the issue with Red Bull. Laz, are you? I guess surprised again to use the same question that Carlos Sainz wasn't willing to maybe hedge or change his expectations and accept a one-year deal that he, you know, stuck to his guns and wanted something longer and then maybe missed out on opportunity to race for Red Bull. No, I think Carlos was right to do that. And I, you know, you've got to look after yourself. If you go in on a one-year contract against Max Verstappen in 2025 in a car that is an evolution of the car that Max Verstappen will probably win a third consecutive championship with, this year, you're asking a huge amount of yourself to then prove yourself to be, you know, to be anything other than blown away and kind of resigned to the driver market rubbish dump. Um, to, to use a to use a British uh, word, but um, yeah, I I I feel like Carlos had to look for a long term deal because one year against Max um is it, really really tough. It's a bit different for Checo because he's already been there and you know mm. it's it's a it's a long thing. I wouldn't have been that surprised if Checo had signed a one year deal. Obviously it's way better for him to have this two year deal in place, but I wouldn't be surprised if he had settled for a one year uh, deal. But yeah, for, for for Carlos he has to look at this stage of his career at the age he's at right now, okay, where am I going to you know put myself so that I can move forward up the grid if necessary or perhaps be part of a project that will move forward in the future and of course the big thing hanging over every driver's decision right now um is the 2026 regulations who's going to have the best engine under those regulations a lot of the signs in the paddock although i don't think anyone knows absolutely for sure is pointing towards mercedes and there's big doubts about red bull because they're building their engine by themselves for the first time that's a huge undertaking I'm not saying they're going to get it wrong they've had a lot of good people they've got an Incredible new facility in Milton Keynes, but it's a huge amount to ask. So there's a question mark there. Um, you know, uh, whereas with a uh, Mercedes engine, you're looking um, pretty solid. And then, of course, if you look at Ferrari, well, that's all sealed up with Lewis Hamilton and Charlotte Clerk. If you look at McLaren as another Mercedes engine option, well, that's all sealed up with Norris and, and Oscar Piastri. So I think, yeah, science was right to look um, long term and kind of keep his options open. But it's looking increasingly like he's been kind of funneled towards Williams, which is not something I would have said at the start of the no. year when right. um, when Ferrari announced that Carlos would not be continuing with them because they had Lewis Hamilton coming in. I wouldn't have thought that Williams would be the, the option he ends up with. But when you start to look at it, and if that is maybe a, a two-year with options deal going forward, then um, it could be a position where if Williams have a fairly competitive car in 2026, he can then use that to open up and play the market a bit when it's more obvious where everybody stacks up under the next set of regulations. So I think Carlos ultimately has had his hand moved a little bit. Like I don't think this has been entirely, obviously hasn't been entirely his decision of, of, of where he got to go and, and where he wanted to be. I think he would have loved to stay at Ferrari if it, if it had the possibility to do it. But with everything that's played out, it seems like Williams is, is the best possible option to him. Um, the only thing that is interesting about that is, um, what it means for the Audi Sauber project and how little confidence it seems quite a few drivers have in that project. Uh, of course, we know Nico Hulkenberg's already signed up, but if you look at where he was in his career, I don't think he had any better options than that going forward. And, you know, it will be a good position for him as a German driver, a German team um, launching, you know, this big brand going forward, potentially something he can uh, latch himself to after his F1 career as well. But um, yeah, for the other drivers, the likes of Carlos Sainz not to believe in that project, uh, I think is is interesting and significant going forward. And isn't that so depressing? Like <clears throat> Audi coming in, big new, you know, there should be a big wave of interest there. And all, you know, Lawrence is completely right. You know, every single conversation you have is people say, well, look, you know, under the current rules as they are, it's going to be very difficult for Audi to come and hit the block straight away. They're basically building a team. They put, they've got a you know a team of, of people with a lot of experience you know different different types of experience in there but they're you know they're bringing all these people together from scratch and it's kind of 
it's deflating in a way because when when they announced that Audi move, I thought, oh, what a kind of wild card option that could be for a few drivers. You know, you know, maybe you maybe you you back that from the beginning, but yeah, clearly Carlos not wanting to go there. It's just that fear of almost that McLaren Honda kind of. That's the only kind of comparison I can think of when when Honda came back with McLaren. They were so far behind. I'm not saying Audi will be that bad, but I think that some people are, are worried. Like, hey, you know, this, these are guys coming in, competing with guys that have been doing this for a long time now. You know, against each other. Um, yeah, the, the 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 pain that would have for your career is so is so damaging. I spoke to one agent in Monaco, and I was like, to to their driver who is not currently signed for 2025, and I said, what about Audi? Like, and they just looked at me and said, nah, like, I just don't. Like, we just don't see it. We just we, we're just not that impressed. And I've, that's that's kind of been quite deflating because um I was hoping that would be a a kind of you know a bit of a spark in this driver market but it's actually because yeah Lawrence is completely right as well I think when that Lewis news was announced at the end of January if you'd put money on it you'd have put money on science to sal- to to Audi Sauber you know that was mm-hmm. that almost seemed like a certainty at one point a few months ago and it's just slowly kind of fizzled away so that's been a quite interesting one to follow um but yeah and now their their options for audi because i mean hulkenberg's never had a podium hulkenberg yeah he's german but i don't think he's really that big of a name to lead that team into the new era you're kind of limited on options so it's a that's an interesting situation in itself